Who did God love? And when did he love them? It's a question I never really expected to be asking from the pulpit of this chapel. For the message of the love of God has been something that has so characterized Southern Baptists as long as I have known them and as I've read through their history. It's hard to imagine even asking that question, but that is in fact a question that some are asking today. Who did God love? Does God love some of us and not others of us? I can think of a few it wouldn't upset me if he didn't love. Who does God love? If you have your Bibles, open them please to Matthew chapter 5. I've been having a wonderful time in the Sermon on the Mount uh, these last several months and have enjoyed swimming around in it and realizing more and more how absolutely crucial the Sermon on the Mount is to undeat the Christian life and what God is all about. One might ask, does God really care about our behavior? Does God really care about our attitudes? And the answer is a resounding yes. And in today's culture, that matters. When I was finishing my dissertation, I started collecting some books to read. I was going on a long train trip right after I turned in my dissertation as a way to relax and just uh, think some meaningless thoughts for a while. I thought, okay, I'll read some novels. And so I gathered some novels that were a bit unusual. They were written by major American novelists with religious characters who did not write religious books. And so people like Harold Robbins, not known for his great religious books, Stephen King and others, and over a series of about five novels, I read something very interesting. These were authors who were not well known as religious people who were not writing to defend or explain the Christian faith, but they had written a novel that had a central religious theme with characters in it like pre-pastors and other people. And what I discovered was something quite unusual. Almost without exception in that little group of novels, there was, number one, an affirmation of the local church and that the local church plays an important role in life, which I was very glad to see. There was an affirmation of the righteousness of God and the judgment of God against sin, which I was happy to see. But there was also a great disconnect because in virtually none of those works did the novelist see any connection between the righteousness of God as a big concept and the individual way we live our lives as a little concept. They were fine with the holiness of God. One was even about God judging the world for its sin, but the primary religious characters were engaging in all sorts of immoral behavior over the course of the novel, absolutely no reference to God judging sin whatsoever. So our culture is longing for a word about a God who is who is powerful and glorious, who has some standard of righteousness, who balances the books, if you will, but it does not necessarily think that that God would be so bold as to be concerned about how I might live my life on Tuesday. However, that is not the New Testament message. It does tell us that God does really care, and there are two reasons why God cares. Certainly God cares because he is a righteous judge. He wants all things done rightly. He is righteous in his own ways. He wants his creation to live rightly. But there is a second very particular reason why God really pays attention to the conduct of those of us who are his children, and that is he intends our conduct to be a revelation of him to the world. The Sermon on the Mount tells us we are to so lies before men that they will see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. God intends for the way we live to be one of the most important venues one of the most important opportunities for people to get to know him. And so the Sermon on the Mount may be the most exhaustive discussion and description and application of the disciples' life, living righteously. What does a life look like when you live it on God's terms? And a very powerful, eloquent, and moving testimony it is of what God expects from you and me. And I want us to just focus for just a few moments today on Matthew chapter 5. Let's begin reading in verse 43. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 43. Number six of six admonitions that Jesus is dealing with contrasting common expectations and God's real expectation. Verse 43. You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. 
But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore you are to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. The language is interesting. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor, hate your enemies. And we're dealing with that wonderful Greek word, agape, and that wonderful word for hate. And both of them are very vivid, pointed words about love and about hate. And Jesus says, the expectation of the world, love those who love you. Love those who have a good sense to laugh at your jokes. Love those who agree with you. Love those who think you're wonderful, who help you. And hate your enemies. But I tell you, you are to love your enemies, even as your Father in heaven. And Jesus draws a very direct, intentional, pedagogical, I am teaching you, parallel. You and I are to have in our attitudes towards the people with whom we have the deepest and most profound disagreements bordering on the point of hatred. The view that God has towards those with whom he has his deepest points of disagreement bordering on hatred. How does God behave? And the very clear answer of Jesus is God loves those who do evil and those who do good. And there is no mistaking. God loves those who do evil and those who do good. The evidence is that it doesn't rain on the righteous farmer and drought on the unrighteous farmer. The sun doesn't come up in the holy and devoted part of the world and stay dark in the unholy part of the world, that God brings all the goodness of life to everybody who lives because God loves everyone regardless of their attitude towards him. Martin Lloyd-Jones, whom everybody would acknowledge is a very reformed pastor and evangelist of another day, goes to great lengths to say, the love of God that Jesus is talking about here is a disinterested kind of love. It is a love that has nothing to do with actions towards you. It has nothing to do with actions towards God. There is nothing in our character and conduct that pulls out of God a heart of love. It is a disinterested love that is given to us, not because of who we are, but in spite of who we are. And in the same way, our love to others ought to be not on the basis of how they interact with us, but a disinterested kind of love, love that is based upon an act of the will apart from what others do for us. Who does God love? When you look at this whole passage, and you see this parallel that Jesus is drawing. A parallel, our actions, God's actions. We think we ought to love the people who love us, but instead, God says, be like him. Love people regardless of how they interact with you. Could it possibly be true that God would have a higher standard for us than he does for himself? Could it possibly be true that God would want us to love others regardless of interact with us when in fact he only loves the elect? 
The message of God's glory is a great and an important message, but it is an incomplete message without the message of God's love as well. This is why the cross is at the heart of New Testament Christianity. The cross is not a moment of glory. It is a moment of humiliation. It's a moment of sacrifice. It is a moment of the ultimate expression of love. God doing at great cost for us what we neither deserved nor could do ourselves. Not because of who we were, but because he chose to love us. And that parallel runs all the way through. Listen to it one more time. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor, enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? Could you possibly say, God loves some, but not others, when God is giving us this kind of standard for our own conduct? Let's go to life. It was a very well-known story when I was a student in college, but she's been gone now a long time. And there may be some of you who do not know the story of Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom, a Dutch Christian during World War II. She was a young lady. Her family, when the Nazis began arresting and persecuting and killing the Jews, chose to create a hiding place in their home, a secret room to hide Jews from being detected and arrested by the Gestapo. Their conduct was judged treasonous, their acts were discovered, and the family was ripped out of their home. They were taken to POW camps. The parents were killed. Corey and her sister ended up in the same concentration camp, and her sister died at the hands of the cruel and merciless treatment by the guards of that camp. And the story of her experience is a horror of the things we are capable of doing to one another in our evil and unrighteous natures. She was released accidentally, a clerical error, and right after she was accidentally released, every woman her age in the camp was killed. She considered it a miracle of God, but she watched her sister die in that camp under the brutal treatment of the guards. And so the war was over, and Corey Ten Boom began sharing the message of what God taught her about forgiveness in churches, first in Holland, and then Europe, and eventually all over the world. Now, here is what happened to her at the end of a church meeting when she shared her story of what God told her about forgiveness. It was in a church in Munich I saw him, a balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947, and I had come from Holland to defeated Germany with the message that God forgives. It was the truth they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed-out land, and I gave them my favorite mental picture. Maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind, I like to think that's where forgiven sins were thrown. When we confess our sins, I said, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There were never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People simply stood up in silence. In silence, collected their wraps. In silence, left the room. And that's Wayne, working his way forward against the others, 
One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat, the next a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. Now he was in front of me with his hand thrust out. A fine message, Fräulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among those thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. I was face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time I have become a Christian, I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fräulein, again the hand came out, will you forgive me? And I stood there. I whose sins had again and again forgiven, and I could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death just for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out. But to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing that I had ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus said, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I knew it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able also to return to the world and rebuild their lives no matter what the physical scars. Those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and horrible as that. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. What a beautiful statement. Help, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands. The former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love as intensely as I did in that moment. Now I ask you, does God expect of us what he does not expect of himself? I say no. The love of God is a love freely given. The love of God does not negate 
the righteousness of God. It would be impossible for you to conceive that I would ever misbehave as a child growing up in my home, but I had four sisters and they were really bad. My mom loved them. She's here today. She loved them as much as she loved me. And whenever she had to discipline them for their many, many, many problems, she never stopped loving them, even when judgment was rendered. And so you say, is the love of God compatible with the judgment of God? Yes. One is judicial. The other is individual. They are compatible. And the message that we have is the most wondrous, more wondrous than anyone could conceive or make up all on their own. For if you were to ask me, when someone stands before the judgment seat of God, they have not repented, they have not cried out to Christ for forgiveness of their sin, they are condemned to an everlasting judgment. Are they rejecting the hatred of a God who hated them? No. They are rejecting the love of a God who loved them. And they didn't want it. Now what does that mean to you and me? And then I am done. We have five core values in OBTS. Core value number one, doctrine integrity. We believe the Bible is the word of God. Believing that, we will preach it and teach it and submit to it. Core value number two is spiritual vitality. It's not enough to have right doctrine in your head if your heart is cold towards God. We must have an ongoing daily intimacy with him. Core value number three, mission focus. We are all here to get the gospel to the very ends of the earth so that every man and woman, boy and girl, will have an opportunity to hear about God and his wondrous love for them through Jesus Christ, his sacrifice on the cross, his glorious resurrection, his amazing grace that can transform any one of us. Core value number four, characteristic excellence, everything we do. We do the very best of our abilities, not to make us look good, but to make Jesus look good. Core value number five, servant leadership. We are here to nurture the people we lead, not simply to ask them to do things. Our focal point this year is characteristic excellence, core value number four. And here's my final application. Do you think God notices how we interact with each other? Yes. Do you think, God, that there are occasionally times when we don't agree? Do you think God notices that we might get really mad at each other sometimes? Do you think God notices that we have our fusses and our feuds? So, how are we to live with one another? In love. Not perfectly, because that is not possible. Not everyone yet understands when I am right. Not perfectly, because that is not possible. How are we to live with one another? In love. Giving one another the love that we get from God so that we reveal Him and His attitudes towards us completely apart from what we do with one another. God is an expression of the reality in God's character and being. The love of God is the standard for our interactions with each other. Let us tell the nations of the love of our glorious God and let us live with love for one another. Would you join me for a word of prayer? Father, we thank you so much for these precious faculty people, these new members of our teaching team who are committing their lives to serve these students by passing on everything you have taught them. This wonderful group of people who have labored here through these years so faithfully, so earnestly, throughout all manner of obstacles and heartaches and difficulties as we have experienced in our journey after Katrina. And Father, thank you especially. Thank you especially 
for the privilege of being a community. A community in a place that doesn't have a faculty lounge. A community in a place where most of us live in this same campus. Our children play on the same playgrounds. Most of us have interactions at several different levels in and out of the classroom. Thank you for the privilege of being a part of a community. And Father, we pray that you would so work in our hearts that you would release in us every single day, in every single interaction and conversation, that wonderful, divine, heavenly love. May we get it from you that we might give it away. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Take a moment and come by and say thanks to this wonderful faculty group for all that they have done. God bless you.